Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Shane Gables, the edgy American on YouTube, and now the man behind edgy American blades. Within the last year, Shane has taken his love for knives, heat-treated steel, and slicey blade geometry all the way to its logical conclusion, now spending his days making knives, learning through trial and error, and the tutelage of one of my absolute favorite custom knife makers. In speaking with Shane about his budding passion on the making side of knives, I predict that we'll see a lot more of his work in the coming years, which so far seems to have all the ingredients a true knife junkie is looking for. We'll catch up with Shane, uh, but first be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell and uh, comment on the show. Also share it with a friend. That's one of the best ways you can help the show. If you want to help the show monetarily, you can go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon or uh, scan that QR code right there on the screen. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash BattleBox. Shane, welcome back to the Knife Junkie podcast. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, Bob. Glad to be back. Well, uh, I saw you most recently in June uh, 2024 at Blade Show. Just in passing, actually, you uh, were spreading the word about the American Blade Works slip joint, which I ran over. I got one of the last two, I believe. How was your Blade Show this year, sir? It was really good. I had a uh, had a really good time. I didn't go there with the intentions of purchasing anything, and then I left with my ABW Slippy and my AB. I <laughs> failed it. My ABW Button Lock. Um, as you can see, my my fingers are bandaged up, so I'm not in my <laughs> flipping shape right this minute. But uh, yeah, I had a great time, man. As always, it was really more about the people. But uh, really, I didn't get to spend my normal two hours with Bob, with Bob DeMarco this year, so that was a little disappointing. That was disappointing. It's usually yeah. over uh, over a couple of beers and uh, yeah. and uh, kind of do the rundown of the show and what you've seen. So this time. I presume you were doing a lot of looking at materials more than usual. Let's talk about this. Uh, Edgy American yeah. is now making blades. Yes, sir. Uh, and when you say I was looking at materials, I did do a lot of material shopping. However, what I spent the majority of my time doing was looking at things knife makers do to hide mistakes. Um, it, it's almost uh unhealthy when you realize when you start realizing why things are the way they are and it's because of either it, it's either there to hide a mistake or it's there to keep you from having to do a lot of extra work to finish it now, now that doesn't mean i have anything wrong or have anything against those processes but i learned a lot looking at other people's work Wait, what do you mean um uh, okay so the the first thing I thought of was the F-4 Phantom, uh, the United States uh, air superiority fighter in the Vietnam era. That thing looks like it does, which is very cool, uh, yeah. due to a whole bunch of mistakes. You know, the wings going up this way and then that way. And there, there are a whole bunch of they just strapped some super powerful engines on it and sort of overrode a lot of uh, design mistakes along the way. Um, what is what are you talking about in terms of knife makers and what did you see? Well, um you know, when I first started making knives, I started practicing on some mild steel. I had a bunch And I ran into issues with, you know, imperfections in my grind. Uh, we seem to be having uh, an issue here with your connection um hopefully it snaps back in a second uh but uh we will uh take a look you were having issues with your grind is uh shane are you all right there you are man you froze up i i apologize i'm sorry sorry. it does that sometimes and i've got a gig of high-speed internet the the fiber boxes across the street but anyway you know i had issues as anybody would learn how to grind 
and I was getting some advice on how to hide those issues. So then when I started looking at Blade Show and I realized how many $500, $700, $800 knives, you know, uh, that they did these processes on. And I realized that that's so that they don't have to have perfect grinds. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it, it really opened my eyes and, and gave me the confidence to move forward because, you know, I at least had my head well. If I can't get a perfect bevel, I can do this, you know, but now that's not not good enough. You know, yeah. I, I, I won't accept that now. If I do an acid uh, acid stone wash now, it's because I want to, not because I want to hide a janky bevel because oh, it will hide a janky bevel. <laughs> because it'll eat away at uh, at the line a little bit or it, it eats away at the line a little bit. Plus, it eats away at those ridges that cause the reflections that make a facet and a bevel. Uh, is, that's what exposes it is the mm -hmm. way it reflects light. You look at it and, you know, two parts of the bevel are reflecting light differently. You're like something's not right here. And, it, and that takes that away. Now, like I said, I'm not bad mouthing acid stone wash. I, I think it looks good on, on some knives, and I still do it. But the difference is now I'm doing it on a good bevel. You know, I'm not doing it mm -hmm. to hide anything. Right. Uh, you know, uh, I years ago, I was talking with uh, Ken Vihikite of Black Rock Knives, who a part of his aesthetic is that uh, rock patterning, uh, in the blade itself, but there was a period of time where everyone was like, oh, that's just because you can't grind well. And he was like, okay, let me post every stage of making this knife. Uh, uh, this is an aesthetic choice that happens towards the end, but here, here are my perfect grinds before I get there. Right. Uh, so to justify kind of his aesthetic, he had to show everyone that he can actually do it. That would be like an abstract painter, you know, making sure that everyone knows that he can actually draw a legit portrait. Right. You're exactly right. And that's why I say, you know, I mean, I, I still do some acid stone wash. I think it looks great on some knives, but you know, I, I've, I feel a lot better now that I'm not doing it to, to hide something. Take us to the moment, uh, Shane, where, where you, where you decided it's time to put uh, steel to grinder and start doing this myself. How did that decision get made? All right. I, I had sent you a picture of a really ugly knife I made years ago, and I'd been practicing and talking about making knives for a while. But what really motivated me, and some people aren't going to like this, but what really motivated me and lit a fire under me was that six inch. Um, I'll wait and ask you if you want me to say the name brand, but a little six inch fixed blade out of China that was $247. And I wasn't. I don't think people understand that I'm not mad about the price. If you think the knife is worth that, then 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 pay it and own it. Mm -hmm. I do have an issue with normalizing a Chinese product costing that much. You know, normalizing a mass-produced, machine-stamped product out of China being more expensive than something that you know has been made here in the United States by a real you know by a person by hand. And I thought I can I can beat that, and I'm going to prove it. That's that's what motivated me. Interesting. So you're you're talking about a fixed blade knife that that was the first in a line of folders. Um, uh, you know, after many many folders from that brand, right. uh, presumably that brand went to the same manufacturer and said, "Okay, we're doing a fixed blade now," and it it, it sort of incurred the same price. Uh, right. as the as the folders and and to you uh the fact that that all happened in china and it was a fixed blade knife it could have been done here absolutely it could have been done here the, people will tell you it can't be done here but it can and it is being done here um i'm not i don't want to get into the weeds on that and start some controversy but there are knives that people we know own you may own one or one or more of them that were completely 100% made at New Jersey Steelberry. They may have been assembled in an office somewhere, but that's not what I, I that's not what I want to talk about. I just want I just want to make sure everybody knows that it can be done here. It is being done here. However, you you might not be able to have it done here and make the profit margin that you're seeking to make. Um, but at that price, it most certainly could be done here and still make still make decent money. So 
Uh, you know, it's it's. I wasn't thinking we were going to go here and now, but let's do it since we're here. It's it's funny talking about um, uh, well, the profits that you need to keep a business alive and running in the United States, and if you're having your manufacturing done in in China, I would imagine um, that's due to numbers. You want to you know you're selling numbers. And so to be profitable and to be able to make the next run and to stay in business, um, you know, is it is it a luxury to say I'm not going to use China? Probably, yes. And, you know, I've talked to several guys. You know, I've got plenty of friends, you know, that have YouTube channels and are designing knives. And I get it, you know, because I can't I can't tell somebody, hey, you can do that here. Um, without telling them that you're going to have to do a little something, you know, you may have to assemble it hmm. and QC it, but uh, you know, the, 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 the thing is just the, you know, the, it's the money slash politics of it. You know, Walmart just proved Walmart just released a crossbar lock knife with a D2 blade for $10. What that tells you is, is that that's, they're making money on that knife. So it costs yep. even less than that to make a knife in China. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Chinese government and the Chinese knife industry works a little different than it does here. You know, if, if, if you've got an idea and you can convince some government official that it can make money, they'll give you the machinery or they'll give you access to the machinery. You know, the machine that is stamping your scales or your liners today may have been stamping the base plate for a desk lamp four hours ago. You know, everything, everything's common use, you know, mm -hmm. e everything is shared. Um, and I guess technically from, from a production standpoint, it, it is a superior idea other than the fact that nobody, nobody below that level is ever going to benefit from it. Nobody's ever going to better themselves, you know, mm -hmm. the whole American way thing. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you know, so we, we can't compete you know, with that price because we've got employees that, you know, we would like to give raises someday and maybe supply them with a 401k and health insurance and, and, and all this stuff. So you, know, you, you can't compare apples to oranges, but um, yeah. Well, uh, Later, I'd like to get back into uh, YouTubers designing knives and and uh, you know the freedom and 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 other things uh, associated with it. Uh, I have plenty of them. I love them. Uh, these are our, our brother nerds who 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 put their effort in. Uh, but there there's a lot that goes into that. I want to talk about that. But what I really want to talk about are edgy American blades. Uh, hold something up. Show us something that uh, and and let's talk about that you know that moment you you made the decision and then you started actually grinding i i interrupted you as you began i know you're my, my my first design and one of the first knives i finished um i just tried to go as you know hmm. i don't want to say basic but it's just a nine inch drop point knife um you know those are kira knight handles that I, that i actually picked up at blade show now you know you and i've talked enough that you know my, my passion is you know quality steels and quality heat treats and 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 good edge geometry and and you know i can't say that i was doing that in the beginning but you know these, these are ground as as thin as you can grind a one eighth inch piece of steel you know it's uh it's a full yeah. flat from the edge to the spine so they're they're great cutters and one thing that really pushed me into go ahead and making knives is the fact that I got very fortunate and uh, I just asked, I asked Brian Kim at Transparent Knives, he would be willing to heat treat some knives for me and he agreed to. So, and I know I have sold some knives that people have bought just because Brian Kim heat treated them and I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, so I know I'm getting quality heat treats, you know, and, and I'm trying to do as, as good a grind as possible. My refinement's getting better with every knife. So, uh, yeah, I, I went from that and then I had an idea of this. I'm very interested in a lot, the, the overlanding and, uh, camping, you know, slash survival type stuff. So I wanted to make a, a camp cook knife. Mm -hmm. And that's when I came up with the trailhead. Um, 
the, the thing is, when people see this, it's not a tactical knife because, Bob, this thing is very, very thin. I don't know if I can. Yeah, I can see that. But, I mean, it it's, looks like a chef's knife. Yeah, it's got it's got flex to it. Wow. It's funny you say that because I brought one home, and we now have two kitchen knives. We have a Steve Clary custom chef's knife, but for all nice. the smaller work, um, yeah, we're using one of these, and it does work great in the kitchen. But it was designed, or in my head, it was for you know camp, camp cook task, you know, cutting up food. Um, I would not baton with it. You know, because it, it's about 63 HRC, CPM 154. It'll shatter. It'll get very thin, yeah. But um, I'm really anxious to get feedback when people start using these more because we've gotten so accustomed to buying knives. And, you know, all we need to hear is the steel type. Um, I would challenge that this thing will probably will have better edge retention than any S90V any Chinese made S90 V you have. And this is what 50, 60 year old CP and 154, however old CP and 154 is. Um, but and the reason for that is, is because most people have never experienced uh, well heat treated CP and 154. They, they've experienced the industry standard mm -hmm. and that industry is set by large knife corporations. They say, hey, we're going to run CPM 154 at 58 or 59 HRC because our tooling lasts this much longer. It takes mm -hmm. this, few, you know, these few minutes less time to do it. And in, in a large business like that, all those pennies add up to millions of dollars at the end sure. of the year. Yeah, and, and if you go too high, you might have uh, some blades getting too brittle. Yeah. There'll be returns. So you want to be in a safe zone. Yeah. Bob, I, I right off the bat, I dropped one of these. Tip down from five feet up onto the concrete. Yo. You want to guess what happened? <laughs> that 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 needle point broke off. And I knew it would. Yeah. I just I just wanted to prove to you know to myself. I wanted to know for sure. You know, so that's why I say that is not a hard use knife. You know, this is uh this is an eighth inch. Uh yeah, you know, it's an eighth inch stick, so it's a little harder to use, but I've got some sure enough combat uh hard use knives coming that i'm making right now oh well I, i'll be excited about those but i i love the the ones you were just showing too that the yeah. the edc knives 154 cm is one of my favorite blade steels practically speaking i am i am like many other people i'm one of those guys who have well if i'm spending 200 dollars, i expect to this steel or if i'm spending 300 i expect this deal but in reality the most i probably have uh, between my custom fixed blades and my folders is 154 because I got a ton of Emerson's. Right. And and even at the industry kind of midline standard, 154 is an awesome steel. And, and I challenge anyone to tell me they need more unless they are like scab and they're cutting uh, sandblasting tubing all day and that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, I, but if I, you're, I thought about that broken tip uh, and mm -hmm. I wanted to touch on this because I love this story. This this is a Benchmade Presidio automatic that is also 154 cm. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not exposing it all for a reason. And and I thought to myself, well, what if I had that knife on me, and Lord forbid I had to use it in the worst possible situation? Do, do I want a knife that the tip might break off on it? Oh yeah, I see it. And the the rest of this knife is is still in afghanistan inside the person that it broke off in and that's when i thought about it i thought well you know if that one in a million chance that you have to use it for that do you care if the tip broke off yeah yeah well, exactly this guy didn't and i'll never get this knife fixed i'll always be just like this but you know as a civilian and you get into that situation you're not going to get that knife back anyway. It's going to be yeah. a right, so, right. so no, it doesn't matter. But um, but I did want to build something something tougher, something more hard to use, something that well. And I explained it to people, I'm building a knife that if I had to go to war, it's what I would take with me. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had to cut cardboard with it all day, maybe not. I mean, I'm, I still want it to be sharp and and be able to slice. But you know, I'm building something that I would I would go to war with. Well, I, I mean, speaking as a guy who who has these kind of knives on the wall behind him, and I really, really love, you know, 
what really captures my imagination are are all the cool war fighting and mm -hmm. tactical knives and and that kind of thing. But really, if you're making a knife that you want people to buy and have, it's got to be um, capable of doing it all. You know, it's got it because you're not going to get in fights, probably like right. most likely and and everything. You got to be able to pry open a box here, open up something a hard clamshell uh, there. Uh, my one of my favorite designers, Dirk Pinkerton, is very good at doing that. He makes uh, knives that are great EDC knives, uh, but but flex uh, so quickly into that sort of combative tactical uh, role. Right. And I ultimately that's what we need even even those of us like like me who have very specific taste you want to know that actually what you're carrying uh, can go the distance so when you're making these knives now um first of all let me ask you just so we have an idea how many knives would you say you've made and uh, so far um as far as made and sold i think i'm probably right around 30. okay it's, but I made a lot before that, like I said, in 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 mild steel that couldn't be heat treated. I, I, I didn't even want to, you know, have that be a possibility. Right. I just wanted to see, you know, uh, and improve my grinding and, and and all that stuff. And I'll be honest though, when I went to make knives, um, I'd kind of changed my mind about some stylings, and I kind of took a step back from from what I had learned because I changed to things. So I had to relearn them. You know, my first four knives that I shipped out, five knives that I shipped out, you know, I'm, I wish they didn't exist. Now those guys that own them are like, Oh no, I only bought this so that I could rub it in your face one day. Hey, remember when you were <laughs> making this? So as long as they're happy with it, but I'm happy with where I'm at right now. I'm nowhere near perfect or, nor would I even call myself a truly professional knife maker, but I'm, I'm seeing advancements with every knife. And I, I no longer feel any shame or guilt in selling one. So <laughs> shame. Rick. Okay. Uh, uh, hold up, hold up the, the knife, if you will, the drop point with the red, uh, the orange Kiranite handle yeah. as I ask you this. Um, so I, I I want people to get an impression because you and I have have spoken on the phone. I want I want people to get an impression of, uh, if you don't mind, it's a little personal, but kind of how how this has worked into your current life. You are, uh, you, you were, uh, you are slash were a bit of a provocateur on YouTube in the knife community, kind of um, call calling things out as you see it and. Uh, uh, I think I think there's a general love for you, but I do know you ruffle some feathers, uh -huh. and uh, um, so then you start to make knives. You got to put your money where your mouth is, and and you got to learn you got to learn yourself up good. Uh, right, because I know I know there are people out there right now who would love to get their hands on one of mine, and if they look, they will find an imperfection, and they very well could you know bash me because of things that I've said in the past, but. But but not, but, but not what, critically. What what I'm get, what I'm getting to is you're now a man in the arena. Things have shifted, right. things have changed, and now you're making them. So like, how how does how does all of that feed into? You are now seeing how difficult it is to get the things you demand out of the knives you're paying for. Right. Uh, very very thin geometry, very very great heat treat, excellent steels, and all that at a good price point made in the United States. So how is how is all of that? affecting you and inspiring you and pushing you or challenging you well i mean it absolutely is because just like i said you know I, there's guys out there that I've, I've ruffled their feathers in the past and you know i, I can't I'm, I'm trying not to allow myself to be to get caught up in a situation where you know i, I could be called out for that but but mostly uh Anytime I'm doing something to a knife and, and, and that thought goes through my head and I think, well, well, this will be okay. I try to instantly remind myself, no, it won't. Nothing is ever okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, the, my main motive is, and I, I think back on, well, what would, what would Steve do? You know, Steve, Steve Clary, you know, what would Steve do? You know, and then I think Steve wouldn't even sell this knife. So keep working, you know, and, uh, you know, he, he's been a, a big influence on me, you know, as far as, you know, American, not just American manufacturing, but, um, you know, just trying to 
trying to sell the, the, the best product that not only that he can make, but probably that anybody can make. You know, I walked around and looked at kitchen knives at Blade Show for $1,000 and thought, this makes no sense. You know, that this is a thousand dollars and Steve's are what two eighty or something like that, right around three hundred dollars. But uh yeah, that's that that's the one thing I always try to keep in my head is you know, um, would Steve approve of this? You know, if not, then 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 I keep working. But um you know, the, the one thing that helped me more than anything, Bob, is not learning how to grind well. Um, my biggest hurdle and my biggest advancement was when I learned how to fix a bad grind because I had a bunch of them. I had hundreds of dollars worth of heat treated steel that I had scrapped threw it in a pile mm. because the grind was no good. And I did it just like we do sharpening. I, I simply, I, I picked them up and I drew lines down them with a sharpie from the spine to the edge. And I approach the grinder, and every time I touch it, I'd look and see what well, this angle it's touching here, and now it's touching here. So when I got that angle, and and at first it looks horrible because now you know you've got this multifaceted bevel that's not flat. So you just have to trust the process until that until that new angle and that new grind line you've created starts growing. You know, once it hits the spine and the edge, both, um, it's a perfect flat grind. You know, I, I saved all those knives, every single one of them. I, I got to take out of that scrap pile and 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 make them right. You know, it just uh, learning how to, to fix my mistakes was huge. And now I approach the grinder with 100% confidence. You know, I don't hear I walk up and stick it to it and I'm way off. That's all right. I know what to do. So, uh, have, uh, Shane, have you always been a creative person? I mean, I, I, a huge part of being a creative person and taking on a new process or learn, learning something new um, is that it's just a new process that you're learning. Like you've, you've, if you're a creative person, you've got, you've got that core and you just have to learn a new skill set and, and that kind of thing. Um, are you someone who always needs to be doing something creatively? Do you have a history of this? Yes. I, 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 um, I was a tattoo artist for several years and because of health problems, I couldn't do that anymore. And I never realized how important it was to me until I didn't have it. And I had the worst six to eight years of my life. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, mentally, my mental health just fell apart. Um, I was laying in bed rotting, you know, and I didn't realize that it was because I wasn't creating anything. And so this has been huge for me. You know, it hasn't been easy. Um, you know, you and I have talked about my, my health conditions in the past and I'm, I'm pretty healthy right now, but you know, I, I nearly, you know, I had cancer. I nearly died of COVID. I had a quadruple bypass. I had a heart attack after that. Mm. I had MRSA in my bloodstream, nearly died from that. And, um, because of all that, I ended up, you know, being disabled. And, uh, that's I was telling you, you know, before we started recording, I had to change my lifestyle even more. I mean, being on a disability checks hard enough, but I, I told myself that I was going to take three to $400 a month of that and put it towards making that learning how to make knives, you know, and acquiring the things that I need to make knives. And, uh, you know, I, I've joked with guys in my chat, you know, about the fact that, you know, I was living off of, fried bologna sandwiches and ramen noodles. And it wasn't a joke. It was the truth because it's all I could afford and be able to make knives at the same time. So, you know, now that, um, that was my short term goal in knife making was to stop financing it myself, you know, to stop spending this little check that I get on to be able to make knives. And yeah. I've accomplished that already. So it's paying for itself now. Very quickly. It's paying for itself. I won't say, you know, that I'm, I'm in the black because, you know, I haven't even gone back and, and, and looked at everything I spent. But, you know, when you're on a fixed income, you live month to month anyway. So if you survive the month, you just kind of forget about all that in the past. <laughs> so that's what I was doing. You know, I'm, I made it to the end of the month. I'm good. But, you know, and at the end of this past month, I had a little money left over. 
you know. So that was a first. <laughs> but well, yeah, speaking as someone in the creative world who for many years lived month to month, it's very stressful and and sometimes it really it really uh forces you to think like what why am i doing this this is such a bad choice am i even good at this am i even good enough at this to suffer like i'm suffering for it and right. oftentimes i i came up with no years later i guess i've come up with yes it it's 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 worked out but uh being in the being a creative type and then knowing that you require it uh to to kind of get along m with uh some semblance of of stability mentally right. uh is tricky because uh oftentimes you're like do i you know i've heard so many stories about great movie directors or great knife makers or whatever and there's a moment where they throw themselves entirely into it and leave behind all the doubt and all the like well i have a day job and i'm doing this um i don't know what i'm getting at but it's not it's not easy um, so what, what is your day like now? Are you getting up and making knives all day? Uh, no, <laughs> but there's a reason for that. Um, you know, because of my ongoing health issues, um, I can't handle the heat. Um, mm -hmm. so I can't work during the day. Typically I sleep during the day. I get up around four or 5 PM. And then after dinner, I'll head to the shop. Uh, I haven't been to bed yet. I worked all night last night. I came home, took a shower, and uh, you know, was getting ready for this. So uh, I work anywhere from eight, nine PM till four or five o'clock in the morning at night. But um, you know, I am on a schedule. I'm just not on everybody else's schedule. Yeah, yeah. That may change when the weather changes, but you know, I, I just couldn't get anything done. I could work for an hour and I'd be I'd get dizzy and you know be having to grab things to keep from falling down the heat was just uh oh, i couldn't man. do it yeah and when you're dealing with sharp metal objects and spinning abrasives and that kind of thing yeah you don't want to have to worry about your your balance absolutely uh, not. so you're on the night shift you've got the day night reversal that's yeah. that's uh i gotta say like um maybe not for long extended periods of time but for uh, creative bursts. I have found that in my life, uh, my younger life to be really effective, especially when you're like, I'm up, the world is sleeping and I'm here and I'm creating yeah. this. You feel it's a, uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a good feeling, especially when you come out of it with something useful like yeah. a knife. So what is your process? Are you, are you, tell me about your process, soup to nuts, how you make these knives. Okay. Um, I, I simply, I buy bar stock from Pops Knife Supply, Alpha Knife Supply. You know, I, I have an idea. My, my, the idea is usually bounced around in my head for a couple of weeks before I get to this point. But when I have an idea for a design, I sit down with a Sharpie and a set of, uh, you know, a, a straight edge and a set of French curves. Mm -hmm. And uh and I draw it out on the knife and then I don't like it. So I wipe it off with alcohol and, and I just keep drawing it on there with a Sharpie until I get what's in my head onto steel. I cut that one out with a four and a half inch angle, angle grinder and cutoff wheels, which is the worst way to do it, but it's all I have. So I, I cut that one out. And if I'm truly happy with it, then I'll take the rest of my bar stock and I just lay it. That's why there's uh there's blue paint on my hands. Um, oh. I'll lay it on the next piece of bar stock and spray paint over it. And then the next one is spray paint over it, you know, so that I've got until I run out of steel. And uh, yeah. And then, so then from there, you know, I, I, I try to get them all cut out and then get my, uh, my pin holes drilled. If I'm going to do any jimping, I try to get the, you know, the jimping done. And then they're in a box and they're off to California to be heat treated. And then when they, that way, when they come back, I have, uh, then I have to grind my bevels, install my scales. And, you know, the, by far the lengthiest part is just the, the touch up, you know, the, the final finishing mm -hmm. of the knife. Yeah. And I actually have an extra step too that, most people would consider unnecessary, but when I get done with them, I ship them to Ohio 
to a friend of mine, Kyle, who owns uh, Clinging Work Knife Sharpening. He's also a uh, TS Prof uh, affiliate, and he sharpens my knives for me. Um, I can mm-hmm. sharpen a knife. Mm-hmm. You know that, that that no no doubt about that. I can make a knife sharp, but Kyle has been a really good friend to me in some really hard times, and I wanted Kyle to be a part of of something. And you know, so you know, hopefully as this grows, he'll be able to make a little money too. But uh, I also thought about it, and I, I say I can sharpen a knife. I cannot sharpen a knife like Kyle does. <laughs> um, and and I, you know, I have to find something to set myself apart because you know, like yeah. we were just talking about, this is just a nine-inch drop point. You know, plenty of people have done this. So what 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 makes mine different? Well, you know, using better steels and a better heat treat. Uh, but there are people who have done that too. But the the last the, the last thing I want is for somebody to open that knife and not have that feeling of and it's the sharpest thing I've ever touched. Yeah, yeah. You know I, mean? I want them to have that feeling. I want to think, man, you know, this is sharper than any knife I've ever experienced. So I include that step at a financial detriment, but you know, uh, I don't. There's, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that I wouldn't have been able to do this without Kyle. So that that is a cost you could legitimately pass on to the uh, to the customer, um, but. What I was going to say is that and uh, and the Brian Kim heat treat. I mean, those together with your grind, your vision, yeah. and design. That I mean, that does set you apart. Do you want me uh, to break it down to the yeah. dollars? Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Let let okay. us see. So you take even a a, a stick of. Uh, I just bought a stick of crewware mm-hmm. that I got two knives out of, and that was two hundred dollars. That's a hundred dollars for. The, the bar one. the bar of steel was 200 bucks right okay. so for Pretty one hard. knife it was a hundred dollars we're gonna do one knife a hundred dollars in the steel now granted i make some out of nitro v some out of, so you know that can come down yeah you automatically have to add forty dollars because that's shipping one way to california the heat treat mm-hmm. and then shipping it back so now i'm at 140 dollars average set of scales cost 20 bucks so I'm at $160. I'm going to go through about four belts, which puts me at a $190. This is one knife. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, then when I get done, I ship it to Kyle. So we're at 200. And then with Kyle sharpening and Kyle shipping it to the customer, you're talking about we're at 240, 250 on a $300 knife that I spent wow. hours on. So that's, that was my profit margin on that is about 50 bucks. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it seems like you're earning your bones right now. I mean, it seems like that you got to do that for a while, but while you're doing that, you know, some of the cost of you learning is getting passed along to the customer too, in a good way. In, in, in the way we were talking about, I have this Dan Hank tattoo that every time he sees it, he's like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did that. I used to suck. Let me fix it. And I'm like, no, it's an original. It's like having an early Picasso. I'm not going to, but it's the, but it's the same thing with a, with one of these knives, you know, you're selling. When I, when I, I think about that price though. Yeah. This was $240. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is what I was getting at. This was machine made. Mm -hmm. In another country. Right. Isn't that a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's Taiwan. No, Seki city. Seki City. Now that's the enough too. So it's yeah. made in Seki City and 240 bucks and it's smaller and you know. All right. Well, actually, while you have that that knife out, I know you're a huge fan of that. I remember when you got it shortly after you gave me the S110V um Manix lightweight. Um, so at that point, when you gave me that knife and when you got that knife, I don't think you were making them. No. Has your I could see this happening with me as a cope, but have any of your feelings on what you expect out of a knife changed now that you're making them? You're like, oh, this is hard. Maybe I don't like good geometry. And I'll no, uh, of course not. Absolutely not, as far as geometry, heat treating, and that stuff goes. I think if anything, I would be more lenient in all honesty, just because I understand what 
you know, what is required to, mm. to reach perfection. And that every minute that you're working, working on that knife, you're losing money. You know, yeah. I don't, I'd be afraid to guess what I'm making an hour, maybe $5 an hour. You know, Some, sometimes I it's can, helpful not it. to do the math. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'm happy. I'm happy right now doing it and they will go up as, you know, Sure. As, as they get as they get better and better they'll go up but, but one thing i have learned is it's strange i can come out with a knife design and make it nitro v because i love nitro v good heat treated nitro v is, is excellent mm -hmm. but like i just posted uh, a thing on instagram about my my design the goon is what i call it and with, without even you know testing the waters i put you know, that I had that the goon is going back in production in M4. Huh. So I, I went on AK, uh, you know, AKC and I, or AKS, I ordered the M4 with no orders. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent $400 on M4. But because I posted that it's coming in M4, there was instantly some buzz. Yeah. So, so I know that majority of, you know, my viewers from my channel, you know, we had to have something in common that I left a long time ago. Right. You know, so a lot of those guys do are passionate about super steels. So, you know, I'm going to lean more in towards, you know, like maybe on the first run of everything, I might do it Nitro V, you know, at a lower cost and, mm -hmm. you know, see, see how well received it is. But and get uh, the hang of it yourself. Right. You know, I'd love to do some K390 right now, but it's even more expensive than Oh, people. yeah. It's it, and being a, a shallow guy, I love the way K390 looks when it yeah. uh, it patinas. Yeah. Uh, but so it's interesting that you're saying this because really you're, um, I mean, at, at, at once you're learning, okay, when you're making knives at scale like, uh, like Spider Co. or a giant company like that, there are some compromises you have to make if you're going to be making, you know, 15,000, you know, of this knife. Right. Uh, so maybe that's on the heat treat or on the grinding or something. Um, so, so doing this yourself is kind of uh, uh, showing you uh, that maybe some of the things, some of the criticisms you have at making knives at scale are, 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 are uh, maybe not as founded, but what, what I'm getting at is as a, someone who's had a YouTube channel, you've had a chance to build up a community. You have friends, you, you can kind of see the, the currents of things. Right. Uh, how do you think that helps you in figuring out? I mean, cause you mentioned M4 and everyone jumped on it. You probably yeah. knew beforehand. Everyone loves M4. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'd agree with that hundred percent. And like I said, I've gotten to know these guys really well. And just the fact that they've, you know, hung around through my shenanigans and the, you know, the horrible YouTube channel that I run, um, you know, they, they had to, we have to share some passion, but I, I might be backing it up a little bit, but there is one other thing that has changed, uh, Bob, like th this knife, you know, made in Japan mm -hmm. is technically perfect. And, and what I mean by that, you might not like the blade steel, you might not like the handle material, but the handles fit it perfectly. It all bolts up perfect. It's clean. Um, I may never be able to achieve the level of perfection that some of these company you know, that these machines are making. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that has changed is that as much as I love this, this now feels soulless to me. Ah. Um, I would rather spend this same money on a knife from uh, Apex Alchemy or a knife from Steve Kalari or any small maker yeah. because like this was just made by a machine, you know, it, it, is it, is everything to tolerance yeah. and per sure, but it's just soulless. Shane, I totally know what you mean. I mean, we talk about that comes up here a bit. Like I'll get a, a knife sent to me by Savivi and for, for that first sort of, uh, you know, tempestuous, uh, weekend, I'm all, you know, I'm all about this knife. And then, yeah, it evaporates quickly oftentimes for me. And, uh, it, again, we're talking about, about my taste, but there's also a scale. Then there's like, say my Les George VSEP, which was right. one of those early, uh, mid tech knives, which incidentally is kind of what you're saying. We're getting back to, if you want to make an America, you're going to have to do some of the work. Right. Um, 
that has a lot more soul than say a Civivi. And then I go to a handmade custom knife that's totally handmade, fixed blade, because uh, that's pretty much what I have on the custom end. And that's where the soul resides. Yeah, that's where the differences are. So I don't think I had ever experienced a a true high end handmade folder. Um, I met two guys this year at Blade Show that both do that. Now, now one of them may one of them may have some machinery or access to machinery. I, I can't speak a hundred percent for Edgy Blade Works, oh, but cool but stuff. Experiencing Scott's stuff and and you can you can feel Scott steals in that knife. Yes. And I know which one you're talking about, that cool shaped blade. Right. He's, I don't yeah. care for the blade shape, but mm -hmm. I respect that knife more than any Riot, any any Chris Reeves for that matter. And then I met Donnie Bless, who I was telling you about, mm -hmm. and I find out that this guy's making these knives inside his home. And I've watched these these clips of him on Instagram with a piece of titanium sitting there rubbing it across a piece of sandpaper. To get, <laughs> to get Eventually, it to it'll be a knife. <laughs> right, to get it to spec. You know, yeah. because, you know, he, he has very tight tolerances and that's how he's doing it. And man, no, they're not cheap, you know, and to a lot of people, you can't convince them that it's worth the money. Yeah. But to me, it is because I know what that guy, I know what the work that guy put in to make that thing happen. And it's, it, it almost seems unrealistic that when you hold that final product and he says, yeah, man, I made this in, in my basement. You know, and all I've got is, you know, yeah, I've got a nice grinder, but I don't have a mill. I don't have a lathe. I don't have a CNC. You know, I cut this out with a grinder and then, you know, shaped it until it was perfect. That's mind blowing to me. So, so, so the, the, this is one of those areas where it's, it's kind of, uh, is it tool making? Is it art? Is it, you know, obviously you come out of it with a with a working tool, but, you know, there aren't that many tools out there that people labor over so much. I mean, well, you know, I'm sure the wrench community might uh, might take take exception to that, but uh, it's, it seems like a lot of work going into it and it takes special people to understand uh, the work that goes into it. Do you uh, foresee yourself running up against that in the future? where you're charging whatever you're going to be charging and people are like, well, it's just a knife, you know, but you're like, yeah, but look at the grind, consider the heat treat, right. look at the steel. I, I, I don't, I don't think so simply because I don't think it's a conversation I can win. You know, if, if I show somebody my knife and I tell them how much it is and they immediately, you know, question, or you can see it in their face that they think it's too much. I, I don't, I don't believe I'll ever convince them otherwise mm -hmm. because either you have a passion for what I have a passion for and can appreciate what, what I've done, or you just don't because Bob, this community and the knife, the entire worldwide knife community, you know, if you include everybody that's ever on the knife, 99.5% of them don't know what an HRC is. Don't care. Don't care. They're buying, you know, the, the number one selling knife, own military bases right now is still the Gerber paraframe. I throw uh -huh. away. <laughs> yeah, <people>. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but they're okay with it. They'll, they'll pay 10 bucks. They'll use it till it won't cut anymore, which is very quickly and throw it in the garbage. <laughs> throw it away. Exactly. Right. I'm, I'm not going to win a conversation with those people. However, yeah. I don't ever plan on being at Randall level pricing either. You know, mm -hmm. I, I still want to make knives that, if you need to use it, you're not going to be squeamish about using it because you, you paid so much money. Right. You know, um, I, you know, I've already made some knives and am making some knives that are, you know, creeping up, getting close to, to $400. But, you know, with those, you have to, you have to consider the size and the steel that they wanted. You know, if you want, rex 121 you can get it but you're probably talking about a 200 dollars piece of steel before you ever start yeah you know so i, I kind of see your knives uh if you don't mind my uh saying i could see your knives going 
the root of like an Alex Steingraber. Uh, uh, like I have one of his knives, a shark. I bought it used and it was not inexpensive, right. but it's thin. It's slicey as hell. It's crew wear. And I love using it. It's not one that I'm like, oh, this is an expensive custom knife. I'm going to put this in the drawer. Yeah. And I have plenty of those. Uh, but I could see yours being the type that you'll happily pay the money for, but also happily put through its paces and right. not necessarily put in a box on the wall. Well, I'll say this to even be mentioned in a sentence with Alex Steingraber's name. <laughs> yeah, Alex and I have a, a, a weird past because I did not like Alex when mm -hmm. I was first introduced to him. I was like, and, and probably because we're too much alive. I was like, man, this guy's abrasive. He's kind of an asshole. He just says whatever he's thinking. I don't think <laughs> I like him. Kind of like me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and we joked about it on Instagram. Like I would comment and tell him, you know, how impressed I am with his product and be like, but I, I'm still not sure if I like you or not. And finally he answered me back one day and he's like, man, just, just come on over to the dark side. It's all good. <laughs> and now I love him to death. And you know, he, he, uh, you know, just the fact that he likes and sometimes comments on my post of my knives that I feel, I know this is cringy, but I feel a little starstruck. Yeah, no, I got you. Because there, there are a few makers out there like Alex and Steve and, Brian Kim at Transparent Knives, you know, that, you know, I, knife wise, I don't know anything about their personal lives, but as far as knife, knife making, heat treating goes, I idolize those guys because the, simply because they wouldn't accept that industry standard that Kershaw set. Yep. You know, Kershaw said 14C at 59. Well, now, now all your heat treat, your large heat treating companies, that's what they're heat treating at. So if you send your knife in, who don't understand this? They don't put your knife in a little oven and heat treat it to what you want. It goes in there with a thousand, a thousand other yeah. knives. Yeah. So you're getting what Kershaw settled for. Right. And that sucks. You know, in my opinion, if you care about that, then, then that sucks. But yeah. you know, that that's why uh I wanted more than anything to have some knives heat treated by Brian and some by Steve and some by Alex. And Alex keeps telling me he don't have time, but I don't know that I could sell it if he did it though. You know what I mean? I think I yeah. keep it. <laughs> so, so here's a here's a here's a brag. I've made a few knives, and and before Alex blew up or whatever, I mean, after I interviewed him, uh, he offered to he he was still doing it for another knife. So I have a couple of AEBL, oh, <laughs> and they're they're shit, but they're yeah. but they're you know the best thing about them is that he he treated them. Uh, I want to uh, before. Why, why do you say they're shit? Well, I shouldn't say they're. Uh, because they're um they look cool and and maybe they cut all right but the, you know i they are not the product of a lot of work they're so let, well, they're, you, so let me ask you this then yeah so what you're saying is they're they're imperfect mm -hmm. i would rather have your imperfect knife heat treated by alex steingraber than a beautiful perfect looking knife with a subpar heat treat yeah that was spit out of a machine. So don't, don't, I, what I'm getting at is, you know, there's no reason to, to discount something that you made. If you made it and it cuts, I'd rather have that than anything that a machine cut out. Well, and, and nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, a lot of, you know, American Blade Works, you know, those knives, these knives are nearly 100% made in a CNC machine. You know, I, I get it because that's what he has to do. You know, these knife makers that start out making knives, and then eventually end up having to have them made somewhere else. I get that too, because if yeah. the business grows to a point that you have to do that, even if you have to go to a place, I don't want you to go. I still have more respect because you, you made something up to the point that you could no longer do it. Right. So I think there's kind of levels in that. You know, you say we were going to speak on the YouTuber designed knives, you know, I, I and I'm not, bad mouthing anybody bob but if i just don't understand where the pride comes from and the fact that you you chose the route that required you to do nothing i'm well, not talking about the marketing and shipping well, 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 wait 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 but 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 in all fairness it's not nothing to design a great knife. No, the design is the, is the, you know, speaking as someone who designed a knife that ha and that Tim Kell is now making, which to me, you know, he's one of my favorites and right. that's a huge honor to, to me. I don't feel like that was nothing. You know, I drew, I yeah, conceived I mean, of it and 
a hundred percent. But I, I just meant as far as the, the production of it goes. And I mean, you still went with, you still went with an American maker, Yeah. you know, the, the, the easier and the more profitable route, you know, you could have had, you could have drew that knife on a piece of paper and faxed it to China and, and had it made and sold it for the same thing you're selling it for now and doubled your profit margin. Yeah, well, that's true. That's you true. know, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about is it's just that that fast that fast track to anything that, that makes money. You know, I've even got a couple of smaller channels now. Um, I'm not going to mention any names until it happens, but one of the you've interviewed, you know, and he's upset that he can't have something made in the United States. I'm like, yes, you can. You absolutely can. Because I, you send me the design, I'll make one. I'll send it back to you. You market it, and I don't care if you sell one or ten or a hundred. I'll make those knives for you, and I'll I'll cut you in on it just like China does. It's not going to be a folder, mm -hmm. but you know mm -hmm. I, I'm willing to help to help those guys too. Now, if it comes to that and that starts happening, in all honesty, a lot like Tim Kell, you know I will have to start having them water jetted. But and, that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Oh no, I, I you know if you're going to do anything at at scale or anything repeatable, yeah, you got to I mean, you got to no two no two of the 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 models that I make, there have never been two that ride in. Well, it's yeah, and so I always I always think like this since my uh, my my background is in fine arts and painting, I always think like would Rembrandt have used a you know a 4K camera? Absolutely. Yeah, he was using the highest tech materials he had at his right. at his uh, behest at, the, at his uh, fingertips at the time. Oil paint. Wow, that was a huge thing at the time. Oil paint. Well, he'd be all over the digital photography, probably. Yeah. Um, and so you gotta you kind of gotta keep up with the times. We're gonna wrap here in a second, but before we do, I want to make mention of Jed Hornbeek. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite custom knife makers. I have one of his knife, the Me Necromance, which is just. So cool. I would love it if if he made more of them and made them in different sizes and all that. But I love knowing I have one of the few necromances out there. Yeah. Uh, tell me about how Jed Hornbeek has helped. I don't actually know, nor have I ever talked to Jed Hornbeek. Jed Hornbeek is helping Billy Ford at Apex Alchemy. However, that has turned into knowledge that jed hornbeek has shared with billy billy has shared with me um you know i have all the respect in the world for jed hornbeek and what he does you know and i, I definitely that's who that's the kind of guy i consider a knife maker is jed mm -hmm. hornbeek. you know and i understand his knives costing what they did jed hornbeek would not ship out one of my knives i, I understand that you know he would probably tell me not to but he has reached a level of of perfection and refinement that I hope to one day reach. But Bob, when I started this, all I really wanted to do was make SE quality knives, SE mm -hmm. quality finishing, but with better steels and better grinds. Um, and in all honesty, that's not a huge goal because, you know, they're not very refined. <laughs> so that was, you know, I never wanted to make, you know, like some, you know, those, those big fancy buoys you've got with the, you know, the brass guards and I'll, I don't have any in, interest in it. I just, <laughs> I just, uh, there's no passion in it for me. So I know I wouldn't do it well, but yeah, Jed, Jed is, uh, Jed's more, more, more Billy's people than mine. All right. I think maybe I, I crossed those signals in my mind, but I know that you and I have talked about him, uh, right. when talking about custom, custom fixed blades. And, and I, again, he's another, uh, maker where, um, you know, it's, don't take this the wrong way, but it's obvious you're not up to Jed Hornbeek level yet. Oh, absolutely. But uh, kind of like an Alex Steingraber, he's the kind of knife maker I could see you turning into uh, as you as you progress, like making a lot of really exclusive, but not not exclusive in terms of difficult to get because they're so expensive and you only make a couple of them, but like yeah. uh, very refined designs for cutting and uh, with performance in mind. Yeah, what's the odd thing is Bob probably the most refined knife I've made. I only made one of, and I'll be honest, it was because of a uh it was because I messed something up, so I had to reshape it. And it's the only knife I have available right now. And it's a shame that it's not getting any attention because um Ooh. you know, this thing came out really, really good. 
and uh, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love for somebody to own it. I don't think I'm going to make batches of these because mm-hmm. it's got very little attention. But um, you know, it, it's nice to to make something, even though it started out as an accident. Yeah, and 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 be impressed with your own work and, and really happy with with how it turned out. But uh, yeah, I don't think the brat's going to hang around very long. <laughs> Just hasn't got a whole lot of attention. I did want to explain my fingers though. Okay. A uh, couple of things about my knife making that you might find is if you watch me on Instagram every now and then I'll post a video of myself grinding. I don't have any feeling in the tips of my fingers. Um, and by the, if I touch something hot, by the time it registers in my brain that that's hot, it's way too late. There's no oh. skin on the tips of these fingers. I've burnt the skin off of them. Um, so I know I'm going to have to change some things to keep from burning myself. But you'll also notice when I'm grinding that the belt is running backwards. The first, the first person that noticed it, and it blew my mind that he noticed it, it tells me how smart he is, was Donnie Bless. As soon as I posted the video, he messaged me, he's like, dude, why is your belt running backwards? <laughs> well, because when most people grind, you, you, you push that blade up to the platen, and you're feeling for flush. You want to be able to feel when your bevel is flush so that you can get a good, clean grind. I can't feel that. <laughs> I run my belt backwards, so that I can see the spark pattern. And if I have a, a perfect, a perfect spark pattern all the way across the belt and the, the fuller and thicker that spark pattern is, I know I'm making a clean pass. So I have to run my belt backwards, which means all the metal dust ends up landing on top of my head. Like when I come home, it's crusted. (laughs) And, uh, but yeah, I run it backwards so that I can see the spark pattern. Now the result, you know, the result, it's still a, a, a great grind. You know, that's, that thing's as perfectly flat as it gets. It's just a very dangerous way of doing it because it could grab oh. it and sh- throw it right in your face. So you, please wear a shield and yeah. put a hat on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, we got to wrap here. We're going to we're going to talk a little more uh, for the Patreon members um, and and we'll get to that. But before before we do, I just want to ask you where, uh, because I've been making a lot of assumptions, where, where do you want to see edgy American blades? How do you want to see it grow? What's the ultimate uh, uh, goal here? You know, honestly, Bob, I, I haven't set a long-term goal. Um, if it stayed the way it is right now, I'd be perfectly happy. I know that's not a good business mindset, but um, yeah, I just I just want it to, to, to keep going. I would like to get to a point where I have a model, a design that is popular enough that I can ju- I can have them water jetted and mm-hmm. make fifty at a time that are all exactly the same. You know, which also aids in your your scale making, your sheath making if they're all yep. the same. Um, so that's my next goal is to get to a point to where I can have my shaping done via water jet. Um, Great. I don't know that. Maybe, maybe that's a lack of self confidence. I don't know how much bigger. I don't know how much bigger it could get. I don't know. Well, as you uh, master the craft, no doubt your your ambitions will evolve. Uh, you know, and 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 you'll know as you get better. Right. Uh, but I I, I I'm looking forward to watching this uh, grow and watching your process and keep posting. And uh, I got to get one of your knives on the channel here at, on the yeah. channel in my case. That's what I mean. Like I got you. Uh, well, there is one thing I'd like to share. Uh, yeah. I learned very quickly from the on the business side of this. I, it didn't take me long before I was having to backtrack through DMs trying to remember what did that guy want. Mm-hmm. So my my new process right now is uh, um, this knife and the goon. I'm I'm pinning them in my Instagram, um, and the the order process is just go to my Instagram, the knife you want, just claim it. You don't have to pay anything. I don't want paid until the knife's done, but claim it in there so that I have a, a record of who all said they wanted one because I didn't expect it. I expected two or three knives in that first month and it was way more than that. And I lost track very quickly. Wow. Okay. So if, if you're interested in a knife, you see a knife on my Instagram, um, if it's pinned, um, and I, you know, I'll put in there, you know, that there it's open for orders. Those orders don't mean you need to pay anything. If you want one and you have the intentions of buying it, just claim one so that when I get them made, I can contact you be like, Hey, 
you know, this is going to be done in two or three days. You still want it. So that's All how right. All right. Well, uh, check him out on Instagram, Edgy American Blades, Edgy American Blades. And uh, and that's where you can order. Shane, thank you so much for coming back on and thank talking you. about this this part. And I know you'll be back on and we'll talk about uh, about this more as things progress. But it's really exciting to see you, uh, like I said, putting your money where your mouth is and making these thin, slicey, super steel blades. Yeah. Love it. Thank you, sir. All righty, man. Thanks. Take care. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion, featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super-sharp, crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch, the knifejunkie.com slash shockwave. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Shane Gables, the Edgy American. Check out Edgy American Blades on Instagram and get that runt. Is that what he called that model? That beautiful little red-handled Warncliffe, uh, one of his best ever. Let's get that in someone's belt. All right, uh, be sure to join us for a uh, for the Wednesday midweek supplemental and a great Thursday night knives this week, and then of course following next week Sunday for another great interview. Thanks for watching the Knife Junkie podcast. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.